Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner, the podcast that Napoleon himself would probably listen to if he were alive and saved and if virtually everything about him was different, this is where he'd be. Well, um, we're going to start here in Mark, uh, continuing on with what I have written down as being Mark Lesson 10. Uh, my, my ability to count may not be that great, but Mark Lesson 10. Now, when I did, finished up Mark Lesson 9, we'll start verse uh, Mark 1 is where we're still at. You know, the Street Preachers Corner podcast has got, um, I think, 50 recordings now, which is uh, about 45 more than I intended. So, uh, yeah, you know, the thing is with the Bible, you, there is no bottom and you're never, you're never going to run out of things to say. And uh, a couple of you guys have been very supportive and very, um, kind, uh, and not bringing up what a terrible thing we're doing here sometimes. And I appreciate it. So, so there you go. Mark chapter one, this might be 50. Uh, I don't know. I, I did the count, but I know it's around 50 cause I put it on the playlist and Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Now originally, I was going to do this big explanation about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. And I decided not to do it, at least not out of this verse. There'll be other opportunities to do it later on if I decide to do it. But the reason I decided not to do it um, is not because I'm a coward. Because uh, I'm not. But um, the reason I decided not to do it is because, uh, first of all, I claim at least to be teaching the book of Mark. And the book of Mark doesn't mention the kingdom of heaven. So why would I bring it up if I didn't have to? And the second of all, as far as that teaching, as far as the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven, and there being two kingdoms uh, with different different situations going on, there are, um, on this topic, other men, honestly, if I was to be honest, there are other men that have done a better job of teaching this than I ever could. And if all I did was sit there and just quote those men, I could say, well, you know, so-and-so says, and I could read what he wrote. I say, then so-and-so says, and these guys give much better explanations. Um, even if I just sat down and quoted those men, there are some of you that would still be unconvinced. <clears throat> and honestly, you've got some pretty good reasons to be unconvinced. And I say that because saying that the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven is the same, it explains some things, but it doesn't explain other things. Okay? If you say kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven are different, that explains some things, but doesn't explain other things. Uh, I lean towards them being different, but, uh, you know, either, either way you go, it, it, you only have a partial explanation because there's still some verses that go, well, I, if this is, I can, this, this looks like they're two. And then there's some verses where this looks like they're one. And so rather than deal with that, uh, I'm going to slide right past that topic, and I suppose we'll have to tackle it later on, especially when we get to some of the parables. Uh, but we talked last time about how John went to jail and how that sort of uh, uh, made Jesus' ministry, it looked like to me at least, enter into like a different phase of it. And he goes, he leaves there, and he goes to the north side of the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. And uh, he'd been hanging out in Nazareth doing whatever, uh, apparently attending, attending Sabbath services uh, and, and, and maybe some other stuff, I don't know. Um, but he got to, once John went to jail, Jesus goes to Capernaum and verse 16 says, now, as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, come ye after me and I will make you become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Now, now, now here, this, if, if all you have, uh, is the book is the book of Mark? If all you have is the Gospel of Mark, then their reaction is a little odd, because it looks like Jesus, who would be you know a stranger, uh, if this is the first time he's meeting him, he comes up and he says a few words, and they abandon everything. And, and if that's what happened, then I, I would I would have no problem saying their reaction is a little uh, unusual, a little unreasonable. I mean, I certainly would not uh, if I'm out here, you know, if I'm on the job do, doing what I got to do to feed my family. And some guy comes up and goes, hey, drop all, drop what you're doing and come with me. I would not drop what I'm doing and come with him. I just, like, I don't even know who you are. Um, but you don't have one gospel, as I've said many times. You have four gospels. And I, I do say that a lot. And so Matthew 4. So there are some things that happened before this incident here in Matthew or Mark 1. 
So Matthew 4. Matthew 4, starting by verse 18. Uh, well, verse 17, for that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting it into the sea, for they were fishers. Okay. Uh, he, said, he said, Then follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. So here we learn that Simon is, is, uh, is Simon Peter, and his brother is Andrew. Uh, we also see again these men are net fishers. Now, now just stick a pin in that for a minute because I have to, I have to grind an axe in a minute. But we, 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 I promised myself I'd wait. Uh, John one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John one, because we're still pitting the pieces together. We know that Jesus goes. He's on the he's on the sea of he's on the north end of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum, or right side of Capernaum, and he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he sees these two brothers in their in their boat, and they're casting nets, <clears throat> for they were fishermen. He says, "Come and follow me," and they abandon their nets. And like I said, that's that's an odd thing to happen if that's the first time they run into him. But I submit to you. Well, let's look at verse John one verse twenty nine. The next day, uh, this is we're backing up a little bit. This is still John still baptizing. John had just baptized Jesus uh, the day before. Verse twenty nine. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, "Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world." This is he of whom I have said. Uh, after me cometh a man which is preferred, preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but he that he should be made manifest Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bare record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So here, so John has baptized Jesus. Jesus leaves, right? He comes back the next day. John points him out again as being the Lamb of God. And there are two disciples that are with him, two disciples of John, that are there when all this happens. They're there when, when Jesus is pronounced to be the Lamb of God, and they're there when Jesus comes back the next day. Verse 36, uh, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, yeah, sorry, verse 37, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. See what I mean, Jelly Bean? So Andrew was there when Jesus was baptized. Andrew was there when John declared him the, the Lamb of God. Andrew was there when Jesus was there the next day. Verse 41, He first findeth his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted to Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah, thou sh shalt be called Cephas, uh, which is by interpretation a stone. So you see... That this is not when, this this thing where he shows up and says, "Come and uh, come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men." This is not the first time they have met Jesus. They met Jesus before. Andrew saw him declared to be the Lamb of God. They went and stayed with Jesus, or at least Andrew did. And then uh, you have um, he goes and gets his brother Simon Peter, and and Simon Peter and Jesus have a conversation where he renames Peter Cephas a stone. And then it looks like to me that Jesus leaves uh, there at some point. So Andrew's disciple John was there when John declared Christ to be the Lamb of God. He stays with Jesus overnight. He goes and gets his brother. He introduces uh, introduces his brother Peter to Jesus. So it looks like the whole encounter takes place before Jesus goes off into the wilderness. So here's the timeline from these guys for the for these guys. So so John goes uh, Jesus goes off in the wilderness. You have John one happening and John two happening and John three happening. And then and then as some somewhere uh, in the middle of John three. John the Baptist goes to jail. So here's what it looks like. Here's what the timeline looks like to me. So Jesus gets baptized. He comes by the water. He meets, you know, a couple of days go by. He meets Andrew. He meets Simon. He goes into the wilderness. He comes back from the wilderness. He doesn't go back to Capernaum. He doesn't go back to where John's baptizing. He goes to Nazareth and a couple other places. And after some indeterminate period of time, John goes to jail. 
And Andrew doesn't have a, 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 he's a disciple of John. He doesn't have anybody else to follow around. So he goes back to fishing with his brother. And so in the, so after they've been fishing for some time, however long it is, Jesus Christ, whom they've met before, who just came out of 40 days in the wilderness and went to Nazareth, he, come, he shows up and they met him before and then he says, come follow me and I'll, be, I'll make you fishers of men. So the next time, like I said, the next time Peter and Andrew see Jesus, some time's gone by and John's in jail and they got nothing else to do. So there's not a chance encounter, is what I'm saying. It's not the... It's not the 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 the, uh, the 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 first encounter that they have. In fact, if I look at Luke five, Luke five, you might be left with the impression that Jesus just showed up and told people to do stuff, and they did stuff. Well, that would be unusual. That would be that would be very different than what happens now. Jesus tells people things in his Bible to do, and they don't do them. So, why would it be any different when they're standing in front of you? You know, Jesus preached to to thousands of people and uh, wound up with, you know, 12 disciples and may, maybe 100 disciples by the time you get to uh, uh, be seen by 500 people after the resurrection. So, so let's say 500 disciples. I was going somewhere with that, but I decided to let it go. Okay, verse uh, Luke 5, we'll start at verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, according to Matthew 4. And he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which is Simon's, and prayed that he would thrust out a little from land. He sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now he had left speaking and said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have told all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So you notice right there... Um, he calls Jesus master. So this is not the first time he's met Jesus. He met Jesus one time before when his brother went and got him. So now Jesus has gone to the wilderness. Jesus shows back up uh, after John goes to jail and he heads down to where, to where, to where, uh, uh, to where John's disciples were. And he finds them and they've gone back to the family business and he gets in their boat and he has them cast out. It is interesting. I just have to, I have to say this. That every time, you know, you know, Peter is a commercial fisherman. He's a professional fisherman. This is how he feeds his family. But every time you see him in the scriptures, and it actually says that he's gone out fishing, he ain't caught, he ain't caught nothing. It's very weird. So, I'm sorry, where were we at? We were in verse, uh, yeah, launch out of the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered, said, Master, we're told all the night, we've taken nothing. Verse 6, when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, and they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' uh, knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from thenceforth thou shalt catch men. So follow me. So, okay, here's the timeline. So, so he gets baptized. Jesus gets baptized. He meets Andrew. Andrew introduces him to Peter. Uh, Jesus goes into the wilderness. No one hears from him for 40 days, more than 40 days, because he goes back to Nazareth, and he's, he's doing stuff in Nazareth. John goes to jail. Jesus shows back up. They go out into the middle of the, ocean, or middle of the sea there, and uh, they do the thing with the nets, and the nets are about to break, and they, they, they get close to the shore and everything. And, uh, and then after all that, Jesus says, Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And so that's why when you see uh, James and John, sons of Zebedee, a, a little bit later on, the reason they are mending their nets is because their nets were breaking from this instant right here in Luke 5. So so follow me is not an unreasonable command if you, if you have all the facts. If you know the whole story, you do have the whole story. You just got to piece it together from the diff- different gospel accounts. If you have all the, this is the second or third or fourth time maybe they've met Jesus when he says follow, and he's already done miracles in front of them. Uh, Peter has already called him master. Uh, Andrew has already called him Lord. So these are guys that are believers. They believe he's the Messiah. It's also interesting that Simon Peter, when he is confronted with the, the presence of God and the power of God and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing that occurs to him is what a wretch he is and what a sinful man he is. And now he can't, it's almost it's almost uh, 
uncomfortable but to be in Jesus' presence because, because Peter, as a man, is so unholy. And the church services I've been in where the presence of God was really there in a very tangible and real way, there wasn't a whole lot of hooping and hollering around in circles. There was a lot of, oh my goodness, we're in so much trouble, or oh my goodness, I am so uh, uh, come so short of what I ought to be. I am such a disappointment compared to what Jesus would have me be. And that's the same reaction Peter had. But the odds are that Andrew, so John goes to jail, Andrew goes back to working with Peter, and nobody, as far as the, on the human side, on the you know, regular human side of things, has any idea what happens next. Because John told him, Behold, here's the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. And then that guy that he points out disappears. And so the odds are that Peter and Andrew, and to a lesser extent, James and John Zebedee, or sons of Zebedee, odds are these guys are waiting for exactly something like this to happen. They're waiting for something to happen because John said before he went to jail that something was going to happen and then nothing happened. And so when Jesus shows up and says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, they're ready to go. They are, uh, as Darnell G. Robinson would say, they're on Jump Street ready to go. Now, now, since we're in John 1, it is worth noting uh, that the word Messiah, uh, which he says in, uh, we, we, we were in John 1. Let's go back to it. John 1, uh, verse 41. He first found his brother Simon, said then, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So Messiah is the Greek version of the word Messiah. Uh, Messiah is a word, I, I, it's a word we throw around a lot, but it is a word that only shows up twice in your Bible. And we're going to look at them here real quick, just, just because we could say we did. Uh, Daniel 9 shows up in two places. Uh, I'm assuming, I don't maybe I shouldn't assume, I'm assuming you understand that we say Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Uh, Christ is not his last name, you understand. It's a title. According to here, uh, uh, Christ means Messiah. Messiah means Christ. Daniel 9, verse, looks like about 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth the commandment to restore, to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. And it goes on there, verse 26, and after three score two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That's the two places in your entire Bible that the word Messiah with an H shows up. Messiah with an S shows up a few, couple times in the in the uh, in the New Testament, but right there, Messiah. And so, according to here, Messiah means means Christ. Messiah, Christ means Messiah. All these three and these both these words mean Prince. So it's Prince Jesus or Jesus the Prince, and it's Prince with a capital P. Just like it's when when these guys go to uh, to see Herod in Matthew two, they say, uh, you know. We're come to see him that is born king of the Jews, and it's a capital K. And then King Herod is a little lowercase k. But anyway, Messiah will be a prince, capital P, and that title is tied to a timetable uh, right there in Daniel 9 that covers both advents of Jesus Christ. So when Andrew says, this guy here, Jesus, is the Messiah, what he's saying, whether you, whether you really realize it or not, is that this is the coming king of Israel. And it also means... Uh, that these guys should not have been surprised at the crucifixion because, after all, the very passage where you get the word Messiah from is the passage that tells you that Messiah will be cut off, after all. So I, I just want to reiterate that these guys, Peter and, and, and Andrew and those guys, you know, the guys that the, that the New Testament says are, the, are the, uh, the foundation of the church, Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, um, these guys that were the foundation of the church, they, they had the words and they knew the verses and they still got blindsided. They still, when it came down to it, were not expecting him to go to a cross and die, even though he told them, I'm going to go to a cross and die. And that, I, I, I find it encouraging, personally, that, that these guys did not know what they were doing most of the time, did not know what they were talking about most of the time. Um, and so, oh, I got an animal in here with me. Attempting to harass me. Um, 
Now, Prince with a capital P only shows up a couple of times. One of these is in Isaiah 9, which is called the Prince of Peace. Once in Daniel, where he's called the Prince of Princes. And it's used by Simon Peter himself in Acts 3.15, uh, where he calls first Jesus as the Prince of Life. And in Acts 5, he refers to Jesus as a Prince, capital P, and a Savior, capital S. So I say, say that Peter might not have had it all figured out, you know, in Mark 1. But by the time he gets to Acts 3, he's got he's got some things figured out. And so I say that to say, cut yourself some slack if there's some things in the Bible you don't understand. Cut yourself some slack and cut some other people uh, some slack too, because we all need slack. All a bunch of slackers. Back to Mark 1. Now that we've chased that. Now, I, I mentioned a while ago, and I told you to stick a pin in it. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I, 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 I told you that it was it was interesting that these guys were uh, Peter and Simon and uh, I say Peter and Simon, Peter and Andrew and James and John. They were they were fishermen. They were fishers. And uh, let's get back to Mark one, verse seventeen. Jesus said, to them, "Come after, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men." Okay, so I told you to stick a pin in that idea that the, that they were the, the fact they were casting with nets that they were net fishermen. So story time. Um, I was at a place uh, a, a, at a church at a church service, and a, a well intentioned guy was preaching uh, at a church, and an, and he was he was I assume doing his best to encourage all of us to be fishers of men. You know, and it's it's, it's a worthy thing to encourage people to be. Um, and he was talking about. Some things, some principles of fishing that he thought were, you know, relevant. Uh, and it's a laudable goal. What he was trying to do was right, and I'm 100% on board with him doing it. But I just, the guy's going on and on about fishing for fish, and, and he's trying to make some parallels and fishing for men between the two things. And he kept saying things like, it's important to choose the right bait, and it's, it's important, important to set the hook. And then he would talk, you know, he would take those and, and draw parallels between trying, trying to win someone to Jesus Christ. He would draw, and the whole time I'm sitting there, I had like this this itch in my brain. So I don't know if this happens to anybody else. I'm not trying to be overly personal here, but I don't know if this happens to anybody else. But it is very difficult sometimes to sit there and listen to another man preach. Not because oh I'm better than he is. No, no, it's not that. It's it's that my I, preaching's tough, you know. And even if you got things written out, even if you wrote, read out, wrote out every word that you're going to say, uh, it is impossible or very difficult at least to say something, to talk for 40 minutes or so without saying something dumb. And if you don't think that's true, I would refer you back to all previous episodes of the Street Preacher's Corner podcast. Um, so anyway, this guy, he's, doing, he's trying to do the right thing. And he's going drawing these parallels. And I'm sitting there listening to him and this, this, this thing in my brain, like something, something about what he's saying is not, is not sitting right with me. And I can't figure out what it is. And uh, so I, I thought about, I, I mean, I just, it was just like I said, it was itching my brain that I couldn't scratch. And I thought about it for days and days and days. And so, so, so several days later, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I realized that this well-intentioned fellow was talking about fishing with a pole, which is, you know, I'm, I live in the American South and that's how pretty much everybody does things. They, you know, fish with a pole and not a net. And pole fishing is based on deception. Yeah. Think about that for a second. So, so with with a with a pole, you know, go out through your little Zebco thirty thirty, and uh, I don't know if that's a real thing. I know Zebco makes fishing poles. I think thirty thirty is one of their one of their reels. I, I don't really, I don't, I don't know about things. But uh, you go out there and and you put the little worm on there. You put the piece of bait on there. And you, you put it on a hook and you throw it out there. And the idea is the fish thinks it's getting food, and what it's really getting is death. Right? You're not trying to feed the fish. It's usually what I want to do. I just want to feed the fish. They eat well when I go fishing. And uh, my dad can catch fish in a bathtub, man. And I can't catch fish with dynamite. It's just, I don't know what it is. It's apparently that gene skipped me. But the fish thinks it's getting food and it's getting death. And so so it's based on deception. That's why my brain was itching. Because pole fishing and net fishing are two totally different things. They are. Uh, uh, Pole fishing is based on deception. So if I'm going out there and I'm trying to be a soul winner and I'm applying the principles of, 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 of pole fishing, then I'm going to offer somebody something that I think they want 
in order to get something else out of them, to get something different out of them than, than, than what I'm telling them I'm after. Um, so I can say, hey, we've got the best spaghetti dinners in town. And so they come to the church service and then they hear the gospel. And I, uh, man, I, I'm in favor of people doing whatever, right? I'm in favor of doing things because uh, doing doing something and maybe doing it less than perfect is better than doing nothing, which is what most people are doing. So you should do something. But I think you should also do the best version of something that you can do. And in my opinion, uh, uh, problem, doing the old bait and switch it, 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 and calling it soul winning is, is not, it's not legit. It's not, it's not, it's not. So, so that to me, pole fishing is that same sort of thing where I'm going to find something that I think the person likes and I'm going to, and then when they nibble a bit, I'm going to set the hook and now I got them and they're mine. I can do whatever I want. I can bring them in the boat. I can cut them. I can clean them, whatever. Right. But see, in net fishing, you go to where the fish already are or where they're already headed to. And you put something in their way. You're not promising them something that's not there. You're going to where they are, and they are standing. You're standing in their way as they're on their way to not only where they're going, but as they are on their way to eternity. You stand in their way, and you give them not pizza parties, and not spaghetti parties, and not raffle tickets, and not whatever. You give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. No deception. No ulterior motive. You spend your time, your money, your effort to go get the gospel to them. And in my opinion, whatever that's worth to you, that is what it means to be a fisher of men. When Jesus told those guys, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, what you see for the rest of their ministry is, I mean, there are some times where Jesus fed people he fed people not as a means to get them to stick around for the preaching. He fed them because they'd been following them around for days and they were hungry. It wasn't a bait and switch. It was, while we're while you're here, I will take responsibility for you. And I will meet this need that you have that you can't take care of yourself because you've been with me. And that's a message all in of itself. But that's that's what's going on there. That, that, when he tells, says, I'll make you fishers of men for the rest of their ministry, they don't they don't bait and switch. They go to where the fish are already headed, and they stand in their way. Sort of like a street preacher with a sign in the middle of a festival. You're like, oh man, Mike, what a self-serving chucklehead you are. You just you did that whole run around. You 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 did that whole last six or seven minutes of that thing, so that you could make some sort of shameless plug via application for street preaching. Well, I am a cheerleader of public ministry. And so I may have to plead a little bit guilty to that. But the, the point still stands. I think it's still a valid point that, uh, you know, when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, you're tried, your, your, your works are tried for what sort they are. Not how big they are or even how successful they were, but what sort they are. And I think the sort of thing you do in the, in, in, in the guise of getting the gospel out is, uh, is important. You know, we used to go to the Salvation Army and preach. Uh, before all the pandemic stuff happened. And, well, the, actually, they, they, they gutted the building, and then, anyway, the pandemic just added three years to us not going back there. So uh, so we'd go there, and uh, and those guys were, uh, they were coming there for a meal. The, the meal was going to be there either way. So we would serve them food, and we would um, then preach to them. And, man, have I got a million stories from all that stuff. That was a wild, wild, I, I really liked preaching to bums. I really, I like preaching to prisoners. I like preaching to bums. They're my kind of people. And I always wanted to sit down with them. It was really, it was a big deal to me. So, so we would go this thing. I'm, I'm, I'm way off topic. I've got, I'm at the end of my notes. So just let me, let me flit around a bit before I find a landing spot. Okay. So we would go down there to this thing and, uh, and, 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 and it's, it's donated food, right? It's donated food that, um, People employed by the Salvation Army will cook or heat up or whatever. And then we would stand there. We would give the food to them. They would go sit at these tables. We would have a guy standing inside the little cafeteria area, basically at the end of one of the tables. And he would be preaching to them as they were getting their food and eating. We had another guy outside because some people left to go outside because they wanted to get away from the preaching. So we sent a guy outside, that was usually me, uh, to, to deal with the angry people that were outside. So my, my friend Ken Cermak would, would cover the inside 
and I would cover the outside. He would get the people that didn't mind the preaching. I would get the people that hated us, hated us and wanted us dead. And that worked out great for us. It really went out great. We're great, of course. But but I wanted to what I wanted to do, what I read the heart of my my the 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 uh the the song of my heart, Chanson de Coup, which is how you say it back home, was that these guys, these bums, would uh would understand that I am one of them. And they're sitting there, you know, uh, uh, living in a tent in the outskirts of the woods, and they are uh, separating their family, separating their friends, and, and sin has just done a number on them and, and ruined and wrecked their lives. But I still consider myself one of them. So it was a big deal to me that when we got done preaching, I would get some of the food that they had been served, some of this free bum food, you know, and it's industrial quality, and it's not, it's not something you would really want to eat, um, but it's free. And I would sit down at the table with these bums and these druggies and these whores and these drunks and these, these guys, you know, panhandlers. And stuff. I'd sit down right there in the middle of them like I was one of them. And I wanted them to understand that. That was my, that was my show of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a fellow just like you. For the most part, they didn't take it that way. <laughs> For the most part, that's not how they looked at it. They looked at it. Now, this guy's yelled at me for 20 minutes, and I wants to sit here and be my buddy. And, and most of the other people we took, we took, you know, uh, Ken took his wife and his kids, and I took my kids, and we had some other people that went with us for a while, and then wound up being just just, uh, just me and Ken, and then just me and, and, and all that stuff. But most of the people that, that went with us had no desire to sit and eat this food, this, this industrial food that, that was being handed out. And so it was always like a thing with me, like, you know, we'd get done preaching the Salvation Army and my wife said, okay, now we're, where are we going to go eat? And I'm like, I'm full. What are you talking about? I, I, just, I eat three helpings of, you know, rice and gravy and, 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 and lima beans. And uh, so, yeah, I wound up buying food for everybody else, even though we just left a the place. They're handing out free food. But those guys were coming there to get a meal. That, that had been going on since before we got there. And we were brought in because the guy that was running that place said, these folks need the gospel. Because there's some way you can get them the gospel while they're eating. And, I said, and, and Ken Cermak said, we'll come in, we'll serve the food, and we'll preach to them. And you could say that that was a bit of a bait and switch because they're coming for the food and they got preached to. Okay, I mean, you might have a point there. But after, you know, after we'd done it for... I don't know, three and a half years, nobody could say that they, that, that they were, there's nobody that would be surprised that they were getting preached to. They knew this was part of the price of admission. And we had people that would get so mad that they would say, this, this food ain't worth having to listen to this, and they'd storm out. And we'd have people throw food, and it was, it was, it was, oh, it was so much fun. I, I love the ministry. I, I do. I love the ministry. I love gospel preaching. I love, I love, I love telling folks what Jesus did for me and what Jesus did for them. And right there in Mark 1 is where Jesus tells these guys, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And so we will stop right there and we'll pick this up at some other point, uh, some point after this. All right. Thank you for listening. This has been the Street Preachers Corner podcast, the home of random old guy stories and hero tales. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for listening. All, all four of you. Appreciate it. This is Michael. I will see you on the other side.